You're on 121.5, the emergency frequency. Welcome to the 21.5 Show, a podcast for professional pilots by professional pilots. Join Dylan and Max, both with experience in flight instruction, the airlines, and business aviation, as they talk to a variety of industry experts, share stories, and have a little fun along the way. Tower, this is Ghost Rider requesting a flyby. Negative Ghost Rider, the pattern is full. No, no, ma'am, this is not a good idea. Sorry, Goose, but it's time to buzz the tower. I love that. I think that's my favorite scene from the original. Uh... <laughs> I love it. Oh my gosh. What better way to open the show than with a Top Gun clip given the release of Maverick? So let's just say if you haven't seen the movie yet, I think every pilot I know of has already seen it. So yeah. I feel like we've given ample time and there, this is going to be a spoiler alert. So you are going into the danger zone. Jesus. <laughs> So I have an interesting confession to make to you, and I don't know if I've ever told you this. Go ahead, Dylan. I won't judge you. So Embry-Riddle, I enrolled in the year 2000. I was there. So born in 82, kind of grew up as a child of the 80s. I had never seen Top Gun until after I got to Embry-Riddle. Oh, my gosh. Are you serious? When I got there and they were all talking about Top Gun, I feel like half the people were there because of that movie. Seriously. How is that possible? And I don't know. I, I just. There can't be anybody else. I know. I am the only one. An aviation university. And, and I had never seen, seen Top Gun. And I remember being in the dorm or meeting people and, and they're like, oh, well, we'll have to watch Top Gun. You know, just like that was like the thing they said, like the first weekend and we went a bunch of geeks. And I'm like, oh, I've never seen that. And had like, you what? seen like any other aviation movie? Have you seen Memphis Bell at that point? Not, no. Had you? Mm-mm. Nothing? No. I was in the danger zone. That's so. unbelievable. So, yeah. Had you seen a movie, period? A mm, couple. Not a ton. Big Star Wars guy. Seriously. <laughs> You'd seen all the Star yeah, Wars, but never, not Top never Gun. Never Top Gun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's so embarrassing. I know. Isn't that funny? So, yeah. When people found that out at school, it was I was almost expelled. I wish I would have been there yeah, for that. The dean put me on probation immediately until I saw the movie. <laughs> <laughs> You're not leaving Hall 3 until you watch this. So, what did you think? So, I took my... Eight and six year old kids to it. They're really into aviation right now, like super into airplanes. They build Lego airplanes. We watched the original Top Gun, most of it, and then went and took them to the theater to watch it. They loved it. I loved it. I thought it was really well done. Obviously, you have to suspend a little bit of reality when you're watching it, but I think they did a great job. Yeah. They executed it. You know, it's crazy. And I'm sure most people listening to the show know this too. Like the movie was ready to go in 2020. So for no leaks to get out and yeah, that's no impressive. spoilers, that's really impressive, I thought. So I don't know. What did you think? I liked it. I mean, the storyline's a little corny, I, but the videography was awesome. Of course. Like the cinematography and the mm-hmm. way they had the camera. I mean, if you look like, I'm not really a person that likes to see movies a bunch of times, yeah. the same movie, but I'm really looking forward to seeing that one again yes. because I remember like catching a couple things where you're looking at the camera angle and you see the wings when they load it up and real high G maneuvers with the yes. actor's face. But you look, you can see the wings bending up. Like, yeah. It's, you're just like, dude, this is awesome. And then I appreciate authenticity in movies mm-hmm. these days because of how good CGI is. Yes. I mean, even in that movie, if you didn't know any better, most people wouldn't know that the Russian fifth generation fighters and F-14 was all CGI. Like, oh, was it? Yeah. Oh, the, yeah the, the, there's no flying F-14 unless yeah. the Iranians have some that they can still fly. But right. But it, it was seamless because you couldn't really tell. Right. Like it, it was good. I took all my kids too. They all really they all liked enjoyed it. it so. Yeah, it was probably the first like live action movie I've ever taken my kids to, and they were locked in the whole time. Yeah, so it was good. Some of the things though, I did appreciate the authenticity. One of the things that really stood out to me is when again, this is the spoiler, but the end when he's stealing the F fourteen. Yeah, and they actually have like an air cart out there, and he like starts the hover cart. Yeah. Up. I was like, wow, that this like is pretty I'm good. surprised I didn't just hop in and kick the yeah. tires and light the fires. You right, know, there's like. A he actually bit. had to go and he disconnected power and they showed like a little clip of him shutting the door yeah. and stuff. I was like, huh, that's good. That's pretty good. I like the attention to detail was impressive. You know, and then he rips the nose gear off and yeah, but well, listen, eh, listen, can't have it. All. You can't have it all. But yeah, it was really good. And then see, the other thing is too, that a lot of the things that were, you probably got that were lost on me was a lot of the original references to the original movie. 
I just played uh, golf with our boy Garrett the other day, who's a big Top Gun fan, and he was telling me about all these things that they had referred to from the original movie, like the Porsche that his girlfriend Penny drives. Like I didn't. Oh even, yeah, yeah. I knew like, that. I didn't even. And know. the house where. Yeah. So I don't understand. How does Penny have the Porsche? And is that the chick's like daughter? I don't. So no, Let's I didn't get know. Garrett this. on the phone. I know. I know exactly. Pause it. Let's call him up. Shit. Let's yeah. Let's do it. How- What's up, buddy? Can you talk for a second? Sure, I'm just getting a uh, a pedicure. So yeah, fire away. <laughs> you're, you're gonna wish you didn't say that. So this is your friends Max and Dylan. We're recording you right now for the oh, podcast. Thanks for that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, That's we were the best. <laughs> so we're recording the podcast right now. We were talking about Top Gun, and Dylan said that you're probably one of the biggest Top Gun super fans around. Oh, I don't know about that. No, you knew a lot of trivia, is what I said. You were telling me about a lot of the Maybe. trivia. So what did you pick out in the the new Top Gun that was referenced from the old one? Like he talked about Penny and the old Porsche that the chick in the original one had and the house that she lived in was the same house. And then Penny was like actually referenced in the original movie, right? Yes, I think they referenced her in the beginning when uh, she's like one admiral's daughter. Oh, is that who it was? Goose looks at him and says, Penny Benjamin? Oh, I was trying to figure out where she was from the whole time. She wasn't actually in the movie in the first one. Yeah, but I didn't know but where she just appeared not... from. Like, that makes... Okay. Any other references? Uh, that... Well, the words that they put up there to describe what, you know, the... Oh, yeah, the, yeah. Top Gun was created, how it, in the 1984 movie, it was said that it was, you know, just the best training for men at the time, but now it says men and women. Oh, I did actually catch that. Yeah. So, I mentioned so. that, and then, but we looked it up, but at the time, there were no female right. combat fighter pilots then oh, correct i think yeah that's and then what it changed saying. right yeah so that was pretty interesting max and i were just giving our reviews and i was mentioned to him you had some good trivia knowledge yeah, yeah. i can't think of anything at the moment there was a lot of references they had you know between the first and the second but or whatever so yeah cool. it was pretty good garrett i was telling him how i had never seen garrett and i were roommates in college and uh i'd never seen top gun until i got to riddle nice. And yeah, that's what like, dudes, how does that happen? I don't know. I don't know what happened. <laughs> that's what I was saying. I never knew that. What did you say when he told you that? <laughs> oh, are you kidding? I thought he was joking. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I wasn't joking. How do you go to a pilot school and never have seen Top Gun? I know. <laughs> He's so. got to be literally the only person ever uh. to attend Ed Riddle had not seen <laughs> Top Gun. No. Another <laughs> listener is going to email in. There can't be. If somebody out there has oh, a similar story. well, I've still never seen Airwolf. I don't know. Is that a what? problem? Yeah. Whoa. What about Iron Eagle? Have you seen Iron Eagle? No. Oh my oh, yeah. god. This guy's unbelievable. What about Airplane? Uh, I had saw that, but probably not until later. Boy. Yeah, I know. I'm a mess. Jeez. I'm a mess. <laughs> so a Do you like airplanes or is this uh, listen. Is this all a joke to you, Dylan? <laughs> <laughs> all right, Garrett. We'll let you get back to your business. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It's real busy here. Yeah. So. All right. See you, man. <laughs> all right, bye guys. Oh, well, there you have it. <laughs> the foremost authority on Top Gun. Yeah. A lot of self-care. <laughs> Always be careful when you call a pilot on his days off to yeah. say, what are you doing? Because yeah. you never know what <laughs> you might hear. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> have you ever gotten a pedicure, though? I have never. Really? You know what? I was looking at doing I Everyone is tuned out. <laughs> <Meanwhile>. <laughs> Sponsorship checks are being canceled as we continue on. <laughs> Ten minutes in. Last thing I want to mention with Top Gun, these social media influencers that posted pictures of themselves dressed in pilot uniforms going to the movie. We were together on Memorial Day weekend, and you don't have a lot of social media. I was showing you these. I think we could start an entire YouTube channel of just your reactions to seeing these pictures. (laughs) Dude, these were people like airline pilots wearing their uniforms to see the movie. Like, what on earth would possess you to do something like that? We post the airline license plate, or the, you know, the pilot license plates just to sort of, like, poke fun but this took up to a whole new level that was a whole so another listen level. go see the top gun movie but don't wear any aviation themed clothes well i gotta tell you dylan i didn't tell you this yet till oh. we were on the show because of that discussion and mostly because i really like embarrassing my kids in public yeah. i think it's really funny i wore this shirt that i bought a long time ago <laughs> it said if i was flying goose would still be alive <laughs> <laughs> you wore it to the movie yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was so awesome did you get a picture of that? No. I should have, though. Oh, my gosh. Well, for this episode, we have a special treat. 
I've got Max in front of the computer with the Top Gun soundboard. <laughs> so uh, during this episode, I have a feeling we get a few drops uh, here and there. I don't know if the, there's like 10,000 of them. It's too many. So maybe in post, we'll put those in. Welcome to the show. It's 21.5, the show for the professional pilots, somewhat professional pilots, at least. My name is Dylan. I am a pilot in business aviation. I am joined by my colleague, friend, and brother-in-law, Max. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Big show today. Of course, we're going to be talking about weather radar. A lot of folks maybe don't know what they're doing with weather radar. We're starting to find out. We put a post on social media and said, hey, what kinds of mistakes do you see pilots make when it comes to using weather radar? And it was our most responded to post ever. <laughs> so, uh, it was really funny. The funniest one was the ones the guy was painting the ground and then asked for deviation yeah, around it. Exactly. Listen. For a lot of listeners that have been flying professionally for 20, 30 years, they maybe go, you know what? I know about weather radar. A lot of folks are getting hired right now with not a lot of experience. And if you think back to your weather radar training, most of it came from flying with great captains that showed you how to use it. Not a ton in ground school where you're focusing on like, all right, you know, let's. Come on, kid, hang in there. (laughs) I love it. In ground school, you know, they didn't teach you a lot about it, I think. So we're going to have a great conversation with our friend Dan from Advanced Air Crew Academy about weather radar, cover some basics, cover some techniques, and maybe tell you why just looking at the radar on flight is not enough if you're a pro out there. But first, let's look at a good review from HKD Apple fan. I can't hear you. (laughs) Okay. His review says, a great podcast for anyone interested in a career as a pilot. Hey, Dylan and Max, newer listener, but after listening to a couple of episodes, I'm starting to knock out all the shows from the beginning. As we've said many times, I don't recommend listening to about the first five or six episodes, but that's on you. Go for it if you want. I thoroughly enjoy listening to your discussions and enjoy hearing new perspective from two aviators who have much more experience than myself. I also enjoy listening to you two talk amongst yourselves as friends and cracking jokes between one another. Well, you're going to really enjoy the first 10 minutes of this episode then. I honestly burst out laughing with the comment about SkyWest taxiing slow so the pilots could log more block time. (laughs) I get it. Every point one helps. Anyways, that's all I got. I really do enjoy the show and look forward to more. And please keep updating those layover guides. I'm hoping to share a very exciting announcement with the layover guides soon with everybody. So in the meantime, if you've got some places that you like to uh, visit at a specific destination, shoot us an email, info at 215podcast.com, and we'll be happy to publish that on the layover guides. And so thanks for writing the review and I'm going to send you some stickers if you just email us with your mailing address. And I'll do that for anybody that wants to write the review for the show. Max, what's next? First of all, the mailbag is brought to you by Advanced Air Crew Academy and also has a big part in this episode. Our friend Dan, check him out, aircrewacademy.com for all of your training needs. Hey, Dylan. Really identified with your dilemma a few episodes ago. I was at NJA for 12 years as an FO, never upgraded, NetJets. and went to NK because I thought my career was stagnating and wanted to be a captain. I spent five years commuting at Spirit, upgraded, and knew this just wasn't for me. I left Airbus Captain to return to the NJA family as a home base CL 350 pilot with EJM. My soul is no longer conflictive. It's a different pathway, but the pack mentality of 121 is addictive. I'm glad I was able to respond to rehab. <laughs> Love the podcast. Take care, Jonathan. It's great. Keep ask and you shall receive. Yeah. So that's interesting. My question to him would be if he wasn't commuting and he was home, you know, he says he's home based on the mm-hmm. Challenger 350. So mm-hmm. that if his airline gig was the same, but he was based at home, I wonder if, if that would have changed the decision or he'd still done the same thing. That's a good question. So, Jonathan, let us know. Jonathan, please. Good email. And thank you for writing in. Don't make a decision until you have a decision to make. Great piece of advice and just one I've struggled with from time to time. Max, that quote, I feel like we're going to have to put that on some merch. some real traction. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. that might have to be on the next cup or goblet. I think so. Stein. That's what we need, a stein. A stein. There you go. Just wanted to write to commiserate with you a bit. I've always made pros and cons lists whenever I was thinking about accepting a new job, but I can tell you that what's even harder, every time I've been furloughed, I would go out and find another job to keep food on the table. Sometimes that new job would require that we relocate. The wife got a new job. The kids started a new school. We make new friends. We put down roots. And then somewhere between a year and seven years later, it happened. A recall notice shows up via certified mail. Take it or leave it. The best way I can describe it is you were dating your first love. She is a spectacular woman who knows you better than anyone else in the world. 
Through the lens of memory, she is flawless, the one that got away. And then years later, she calls you out of the blue. (laughs) (laughs) Such a good analogy. So it's like that. At first, you're excited. Your heart races. You pace the floor, reading the love letter over and over again. And you start thinking about the what ifs. As pilots like us do, I would write pros and cons lists and carry them around with me for days, adding items to each column as I think of them. Scratching some out, trolling the forums, calling my dad, talking to my wife, calling college buddies, asking strangers. But eventually you have to make the decision. Of the four furlough recalls I've had to entertain over the years, I only accepted one, and it barely counts. I was furloughed from flying checks in a bonanza, and I got recalled to a Cessna 402 while my furlough job was instructing in a clapped-out tomahawk. Easy choice. (laughs) The rest of them, not so much. Of the other three, I only regret one. The major airline I was furloughed from after 9-11. I had been on furlough for seven years, during which they raised the retirement age to 65, prolonging the furlough. At some point, life moves on. So I declined the recall and within a week regretted that decision and have regretted it every day since. Deciding whether to go back to the girl who dumped you was way harder than any employment decision I ever made. That said, I know where you're coming from, and I wish you the best of and look forward to flying with you when you finally come to your senses and come to the (laughs) airlines. Not going to happen. That's funny. That was from Mike, and I think that was a great email. That's good perspective. Really good perspective because, listen, we're not playing the furlough flute much these days. Not yet. Which is good, but it's going to happen again, and you're going to have to make decisions about, oh, I got furloughed. Am I going to hang out? Am I going to wait? Am I going to get another job? You know, a lot of those things, so... This is somebody that's been in 121 for a long time and has great Yeah, we've never share. been up against that, really. You kind of were. I basically had to decide if I was going to go back to American Eagle. You basically took a voluntary leave of absence before yeah. they started furloughing people. Right. But then like seven or eight years ago, I had to decide if I was going to go back to Eagle. And I already had a number at American or I had a flow through deal at American. And, and you everything. would have been a captain. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I had to decide, like, am I going to go back or am I not? So you got to go through it. But I did exactly what Mike said. You know, at least you're consistent. Stick to the path. You just keep punching that airline bag away. That's right. I appreciate your consistency. All right. Next email. Go ahead. Hey, guys. I've listened to almost all your episodes and really appreciate all the insight you have to offer. I wanted to follow up on episode 77 where Dylan found himself at a career crossroads. I was recently in a similar situation. I've been very fortunate to have the typical, quote, fast track airline career. I was hired by SkyWest at 21, moved on to Spirit at 23, and most recently upgraded to captain on the yellow school bus at 26. (laughs) (laughs) I understand how lucky I am to have gotten this industry at an ideal time and recognize all the pain that pilots before me had to deal with in their careers, like 9-11, the lost decade, age 65, and the recession. I'm extremely happy at Spirit. I love the people I work with. I'm based at home, fly about five days a month, and make more money than I need. Unlike many of our passengers, I really like the business model and believe it's more resilient in poor economic times. However, all my friends at Legacy Airlines constantly tell me how great it is, how I have so many years ahead of me in my career, and how I would be an idiot not to apply. So I did. Max's advice of you don't have a decision to make until they offer you the job really resonated with me. Only two months after printing out my applications, I interviewed at American Airlines and was subsequently offered a class date. I weighed the pros and cons heavily and decided I was going to stick it out at Spirit. It was an unpopular opinion with my legacy friends. Maybe I'm a bit cynical, and I certainly hope my predictions are wrong, but I think the wheels will stop turning sooner rather than later. Inflation is out of control, fuel prices are on the rise, and a recession is looming. I decided the grass isn't always greener. I'm 50% seniority company-wide, I have no ambitions to fly a wide body, and I'm home almost every night. To top it off, I'll retire in the top three at this company. My friends are still giving me crap about my decisions, but I think this will be a great place to hang my hat for the rest of my career. Like Dylan said, maybe I'll come to regret this decision. Maybe I won't. I guess we won't know until I retire in 38 years. Keep up the awesome work. The Frontier Blue Pilot. (laughs) (laughs) That's pretty funny. Sometimes the path less chosen requires you to have some cojones, or at least some gall, we'll say, for the ladies. Yeah. And I think... He certainly has some because I think he has a good chance of being right, too, on a lot of things. Absolutely. A hundred percent. It's funny because I just had this exact same conversation with another low cost carrier pilot yesterday. Here's what I'll say. I'm going to steal this quote from a podcast that I listen to called Bankless. And it says, we're heading west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on this journey. And especially frontier because of the spirit thing, but... 
I mean, that's it. Like we're on the frontier. We're charting a new path. And I think to me, that's exciting. And it isn't, like you said, the typical airline path that you're going to have a lot of friends tell you you should do. And I don't know what's going to happen. It's the Wild West. I think the thing we always see is everyone's like, oh, you got to come to the legacy and do it. Yeah. And pilots' egos can get them into trouble in a couple of different ways. One is in the cockpit of an airplane. Two is wearing your uniform to it, the Top Gun movie. (laughs) God. But another one, too, is making career decisions because people yeah. sometimes will make things that really impact their quality of life because they just have to fly a wide yeah. body. It's like, dude, it's just like getting Listen. a new car. Like, I just got a new car. It's really awesome. I love driving around everything for like two months. And then it's it's just another car. And then it's a car. Yeah. <laughs> so you just got to keep that perspective, I guess. Absolutely. That's a great email. And yeah. uh, people making the tough choices. And yeah. like he says, nothing is more true than... We'll all look back in 20 or 30 years, or in his case, 40 years. Yeah. And see if you made the right call, because nobody knows. Thank you for joining me in the frontier. We are heading west. The front- it's not for everybody. The frontier blue pack. Yeah. Okay. Enough emails, but we're going to jump into some flight advice here with very similar things. Of course, flight advice is brought to you by our friends at Harvey Watt. They are providing all of the insurance coverage For all these professional pilots that are writing in and talking to us, uh, pretty much every major airline has coverage for you, but they have gaps in it. They're not all the same. The unions in the company negotiate the coverage. The coverage at Delta is not the same at American, which isn't going to be the same at Frontier, which isn't going to be the same at Southwest. It's on you to figure out the coverages that are provided and what you might need to supplement. Every situation is different. Check out harveywatt.com for details and protect yourself in case you have a loss of medical situation. On to the advice here. It says, hey guys, love your podcast. Been listening for a while with my boyfriend who is an airline pilot. I'm writing in after listening to your latest episode because my boyfriend has a career decision to make. We're pretty sure we've weighed all options, but it will be helpful to your your opinions. And I promise to write you an update too. Awesome. My boyfriend worked for a regional for six years. He was waiting on a flow, but then COVID happened. He really disliked where he was and is not wanting to keep waiting for an unknown flow date. He decided to go to Spirit last year. We rationalized the low training and first year pay basically for no commute since we live near Fort Lauderdale. A few months after seeing both reserve and lines, he doesn't feel it will be enough for him long term. He misses flight benefits and the variety of trips and airplanes already. Again, we thought no commuting outweighed those cons. When deciding to go last fall, he has always had his apps out to the big three, but we did not expect a call anytime soon. I thought he'd stay at Spirit for several years and then go to a legacy later on since that was his end goal. Well, Delta called this spring. He figured to interview because, as Max says, you don't have a decision to make until you have a decision. (laughs) We do have a decision to make. It may also be important to know that we are 30 with no kids and no home. We do have family in Georgia and New York, but we really have no plans to move out of Florida anytime soon. The commute for Delta is truly the only negative, but it's such a big negative. My boyfriend feels it's too good of an opportunity to pass up, but it's also daunting to feel like we are starting over again. Appreciating the thoughts you guys have. Thanks for a great podcast. Mm. That's a tough one because, as you know, I am vehemently opposed to commuting. Yeah. They're not locked in with kids and everything, but they said they don't have no plans to move out of Florida. And the other thing, too, though, is I'm also not huge on moving somewhere you really don't want to live to not yeah. commute yeah. either. Like, I think mm-hmm. that's why it was so important for me to find an airline with a base somewhere I wanted to live. That way, you're not making a sacrifice on either side of that coin. Now, so spirit's not enough. Totally understand that, right? Yep. And everyone's got to do what's best, just like the person we heard from before. Spirit is enough, and it's great for him. Teach his own. Delta, God, you live in South Florida, though. There are big airlines with bases in South Florida. This is exactly what I was going to say. What is it about Delta? Why would you not just consider AA at this point? Yeah, Miami, which is junior. Which is junior base, and they have international equipment out of there. I guess that would be my main question. What is the compelling reason for Delta? Is it just because it's the best airline? Or they called first? Or they called first? I mean... That's the question. I can't imagine if you have a pulse right now, (laughs) you can't get a call from American. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the numbers as far as attrition is what he's referring to. Yeah. Because of retirements and stuff. I've said this before. American is the ultimate gamble right now. Because if you get on and they can keep the lights on, then your balance sheet is a big risk. Um, But the seniority payoff could be huge, so... That would be my advice. Would American be an option? Yeah, I would consider that, that you could kind of kill two birds with one stone. You get the yeah. variety and the big network and yeah. all that stuff. I mean, it's still the biggest airline in the world. 
and some pretty good other numbers there as far as movement and everything else. And you could drive to work. And they take that seriously, obviously. So either that, and then the other thing I think you would just have to consider is that, okay, you're setting yourself up for a commute. This is it. Maybe go to Atlanta and stay for a few days and drive around and just be like, look, if this commuting stuff was too much, could we live here? Or Salt Lake mm-hmm. or Detroit. Any of those places, or pick one that you think might be the best and just look at it. If you have kids, things change. Your dynamic yeah. changes in your life. And so you just have to, even though you don't know, you have to account for change and change of feelings and change of, of what you think you're going to do. And so if I worked at an airline like and I wanted to live here, but I, you know, I could live somewhere else that there's a base. Like yeah. if it's the only base in the West and you only want to live in the West and, you know, <laughs> so. right. Also, I think if you haven't eaten at La Coretta in the Miami airport, you need to do that too. <laughs> Another argument for American. <laughs> Shout out. So yeah, it's, I think it's a great email. And this is what people are struggling with. I may have mentioned this before. I just had lunch with one of our friends who's an IOE instructor at United. And he goes, man, he goes, you'd think that most of my IOE students would be regional airline pilots. He goes, Half of them are Southwest pilots, JetBlue pilots, Delta pilots. He goes, there's so much shuffling going on right now because you can get the job that you want. So, yeah, I think this is really good perspectives. I think back, we weren't in it, but we've known people who were back in the day. You would apply and it could be years. And whoever called, that's where you went. That was it. Like there was really no choice, not much looking back after that. You had your preference, but it really didn't matter because yep. you just took. But now, yeah, like you said. People are going. So I guess to whittle it all down, is Delta the only option? That's my well, question. Right now it is. Yeah. Are you really ask him to turn down a job at Delta to then hold out for American? Like, that's a tough. Here it is. It's Delta or living in Florida. There you go. Boom. Let us know. Let us know how it works out. Okay. That's Flight Advice brought to you by our friends at Harvey Watt. If you want some flight advice, you can shoot us an email, info at 215podcast.com or visit the website, 215podcast.com and fill out the anonymous form. We'll be happy to provide you with our, I don't know, mediocre advice. No diamond dog. (laughs) All right, let's get on to our discussion of weather radar with Dan. Here we go. We've got our friend Dan Bodekheimer from Advanced Air Crew Academy. Dan, what's your official title? Chief Education Czar? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. (laughs) Content Master. Welcome back, Dan. Today we're talking about the wonderful and mystical world of weather radar. Yeah, it's very timely given our entrance into summertime. Dan, this topic, you guys have a module on this, which Max and I just ran through, and it was a great refresher for us. And I want to prime this conversation by something that somebody said to me the other day. When was the last time you were asked anything about weather radar on a check ride? And that really hit home for me because I was like, yeah, this is not a topic that is often covered in the schoolhouse. And that's why I think this module that you guys have created is really handy and serves as a good reminder for folks about this system, this very advanced system we have in the nose of the airplane that people almost aren't even really taught how to use. Yeah, the Part 142 centers, you know, really don't have time to spend training that particular item, you know, they've got to get through their list of topics. And so it's generally not something you address or talk about at all. And it, if you have a really nice formal initial operating experience program, you're going to get that when you get out on the line. But if it's a typical business aviation operation where you're jumping out to a smaller organization, you're just going to learn from the other person and pick up what information you can along the way and try to figure it out by pushing buttons. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially if you're not flying in a time where there's a lot of thunderstorms and you're not going to learn yeah. a lot from who you're flying with. And I also think one of the things now too is that many of us have in-flight Wi-Fi or Stratus or XM weather or something. And so we're getting a lot of information in the cockpit that maybe 20 years ago when we were flying, we didn't have. I think what we're seeing is a lot of people say, "Eh, I'm getting it on my cell phone or my iPad. I don't really need to turn the weather radar on on the plane. And I think we should discuss that a little bit today as well and maybe find out if that's really actually a good idea. Yeah, you know, it's important to really do both of them from a tactical and strategical point of view. So knowing what to use when is the critical piece of that. Yeah. And when you say strategic versus tactical, I think that's a really good topic. You bring that up right in the beginning of the course. Can you kind of define those two terms and so everyone kind of understands what we're talking about and where what information you're getting from both of those sources? Yeah, the strategic is when you're 
doing your flight planning and deciding which direction you're going to navigate around the storms or what your route of flight is going to look like. And then tactical when you're in the terminal area or find yourself a little closer than you want to around a cell and maybe air traffic control because of the traffic all coming around it. You want to get a little more information about what's happening close to you more in real time because that strategic piece, the weather is going to be delayed and getting to you and you're making some decisions and future predictions where the tactical piece is what's happening right here and now in front of me and what do I need to do in the next minute or two. Yeah. And it's interesting too, because there's a lot more to know about NextRad than just that there's a little bit of a delay. Some of the things I learned in your course about how there's two different modes of the NextRad, which changes how long it takes to scan a full picture of the sky and, and how long it takes from there to then end up in your airplane. So you have basically two different sets of things that are causing this delay. But we use it a lot too in route, where if you, you file or you, if you're at the airlines, the dispatch files you a certain route because of weather. A lot of times the weather moves, you know, not as anticipated and all of a sudden that, that route isn't so great. And so NextRad's perfect to figure out a new route to instead right. of getting there and then deviating, you just kind of ask for direct here and avoid the problem altogether, potentially. And in dynamic conditions where things are changing just super quick, I was watching a storm yesterday here in Colorado and just watching it build and the clouds, you know, you've ever been close to those clouds that you can just watch them build and grow. And it's just amazing how fast things are changing. And in those situations, that data uplink weather is not going to be displaying reality and where the storms move to or perhaps what its intensity is or what the tops are at. Yeah. Which brings us to the discussion point today, which is how do we use weather radar? How do we know when the right time to use it is? And how do we make all those little knobs line up and do what we want to do? And how do we understand that? So let's talk a little bit about the basic controls of weather radar. Every airplane's a little bit different and the systems that you have are going to be different, but kind of some of the main controls on a typical weather radar unit. Can you talk a little bit about that, Dan? Yeah, you know, first there's the tilt piece of it and knowing for your aircraft where that true zero tilt is. So where is that that the radar is looking straight out in front of you, not looking significantly above or below you, or if you do that, where that beam is at. So being able to manage where that tilt is. And I just remember the, you know, the early days of flying, you know, that gain knob of, you don't like what you see, just turn the gain up and it'll look <laughs> <Right>. better. <Yeah. laughs> so those are the two main ones. And knowing your threat identification position and your normal antenna position and where that is for your particular aircraft and not waiting until you need it to figure out what those settings are so you can interpret what the information is depending on what your altitude is or if you're on the ground trying to scan what's looking like off the end of the runway and making that go no go decision if you're going to wait or if now's the right time to leave. Yeah, I think that tilt setting, let's talk about that for a little bit because I see so many different techniques when people are flying and I feel like a lot of people just leave the tilt at zero and they'll just kind of fly along thinking, well, it's just kind of generally showing me what's ahead of me. I'll see a lot of other people dial that tilt knob down and so they're painting the ground in front of them. And then I'll see other people tilt up and so that the beam is just showing what's at their altitude and above and then they just kind of leave it there. Have you guys seen a lot of different techniques? Do you have any thoughts on these tilt positions that folks use? I think any one of them are valid ones as long as you know what you're doing and can mm -hmm. explain it. Yeah, I always like to use the technique just to make sure the radar was working that about the 100 mile mark, you're picking up a little bit of ground returns and that's one way to kind of judge where you're at that true zero tilt at and you're getting that scan that you want. But then looking at the moisture of the storm, I got caught off guard once of looking too high up in a storm and there wasn't as much moisture up there as compared to below it. And so using that baseline of where the nose of the aircraft is and just looking up, you may not be getting that accurate representation because radar is just measuring precipitation. And if there isn't all that much precipitation that's reflective up in the higher levels of the storm, it might kind of sway you into thinking that it's less significant than it actually is. Yeah, but that doesn't mean there's a, not a ton of air movement up there and things at night that you can't necessarily right. see it in front of you. You don't want to fly through. It's funny because the more we've talked about this and after taking that course and things, there's like these different facets you have to understand about using weather radar. And that's how to use the radar specifically that you're using. Because we'll talk about later the RDR 4000 which, like a lot of things in the airlines, makes things a lot easier because it just kind of does all that stuff and gives you this big 3D view mm -hmm. versus back to the radar I was using in the G3, which was yeah. like the little CRT screen 
standalone. It had unit. its own screen. Yeah, yeah. You have no overlay on your route. You know, and I flew. Th- we dodged thunderstorms in that all the time at right. night over the North Atlantic. All kinds of stuff. And if you knew kind of what you're doing, but you did have to put some effort and some research into like how to utilize that piece of equipment. But the other thing too, like Dan was saying, is you kind of have to have a refresher on the dynamics of weather and thunderstorms themselves. Like he just said, you may scan it and see, oh, the big strong return and then much less at your level and you're not concerned, but maybe seeing a bunch of activity a little bit lower than you should make you more concerned. Right. At stuff that's closer to your altitude, knowing what how that stuff works. So it's interesting because when we talked about this segment, it was more like, let's learn how to use the weather radar. But really, it's all these things with weather, the radar system, how to incorporate NEXRAD and how that system actually works. Because none of us really know. We just pull it up on our phones and look at it. I'm like, oh, this is a thunderstorm. Yeah, no, go to the left. But in a way, another thing that you mentioned in the course was weather radar is looking like that wet, thick moisture. And as you go up in altitude and it's colder and it's less dense, it can look like that weaker return and you can be tricked into thinking, oh, this isn't going to be that bad. Yeah. Same thing. But I think the point remains, you got to understand thunderstorms a little bit. And that's something that I think many of us learn, but man, it's easy to push that one to the side. Weather radar is kind of like a lawyer. Words. Nobody wants to talk about it. (laughs) Nobody cares until all of a sudden you need it. Then it's the most important thing in the world to you. Yeah. So (laughs) it's... And what I learned is there's just so many more hazards besides for that precipitation in a thunderstorm. The turbulence, the lightning, changing wind conditions, water ingestion, distraction of lightning, any of that can be those hazards associated with it. And what I always thought was I've got the performance to get over on top of a thunderstorm, but I never got to think of what if you lose pressure over the top of a thunderstorm or what if something else happens that I have to descend? You know, I've lost that option to be able to to descend in those situations. And you get to that less excess performance mm-hmm. up at those higher altitudes. And all of a sudden, you get those wind shifts and you get critically closer to the stall and all those aerodynamic issues up at those higher altitudes. And those are all hazards around those thunderstorms besides for just that precipitation. That's a good point. In Thinking back to my days at the regional airlines where I was flying in out of Dallas a lot, one of the hardest things for us was deciding to go right or left because we weren't flying an airplane that was usually we could top it. And that was the big challenge for us. Should we go right? Should we go left? And I think that's now the huge advantage of NextRat is having that on board and being like, oh, well, clearly we should go to the left. But when you're in the heat of the battle, sometimes that's not obvious because you can't see through some of those buildups. Well, especially too with attenuation. So you can see get an idea of what's behind it, not necessarily very accurately to pick your way, but just to get an idea for, for like you said, the right or left decision. Yeah. Just a couple more thoughts on the tilt. When we're flying along in cruise, yeah, I would say most people I would see are going to paint a little bit of the ground to kind of where they leave it. Or a lot of people are going to have it in auto mode if you have like what they call multi-scan radar, or if you're in the Airbus with the RDR 4000 or some of the newer Boeings. And Then a couple other considerations, like you mentioned, Dan, it's situational, right? So we're coming down on the arrival. Maybe you want to start tilting down a little bit, right? To see what's going to be below you as you come down through the arrival. Yeah. Using the techniques of knowing where you're headed and what's coming up and what information you want to get and absolutely to use that. Did you guys read the recent accident report about the Challenger in Mexico from 2019? So it was a loss of control in flight, a Challenger aircraft left Las Vegas, took off down to Mexico and had an in-flight came apart, loss of control issue. And some of the quotes from the accident report were interesting. They got the cockpit voice recorder and they quote the co-pilot asking, nothing on radar, to which the captain responded, nada. And that would imply that they had their weather radar on and not displaying anything there. And they requested a climb from 39 to 41. And then after that, they entered the thunderstorm and at flight level 44,800 rolled inverted and aircraft came apart. So, yeah, you know, interesting to wonder what kind of radar information they had in the cockpit there. They were Mm -hmm. referring to when they said, you know, nothing on radar, if they were looking at that next rad or just mismanaging the radar in their aircraft. Huh. Did they say in the accident report whether, in fact, they did have it on? They didn't. And I don't think they necessarily know. They just, from the cockpit voice recorder, captured the conversation of when they begin to get into the thunderstorm of surprise of nothing yeah. on radar and then the captain's response, uh, nothing. So after that, the CVR was talked about lowering the nose. You have to chop it. You have to chop it. Talking about bringing the nose down and perhaps an installed condition. But yeah, a total of two crew members and 11 passengers were killed in that accident. 
I remember the accident, but I didn't know some of those details. Yeah, they just recently came out. The Mexican authorities released the final report from that accident. Especially for me, because I don't fly at night a ton. This is another reason why weather radar is so important at night to (laughs) have on, (laughs) because you could be lulled into a false sense of security so easily. Let's talk about the gain. You mentioned that uh, earlier, if you didn't like we see, just to adjust the gain. One thing I learned in the course was that changing the gain doesn't actually change anything on the airplane, right? Correct. Yep. Just changing what's displayed. So if you're in some extreme precipitation and you need to find your best way out, in essence, that can begin to show some more granularity in what that display shows kind of for an immediate action. What am I going to do? But uh, otherwise, it's just going to change the display and tone it down a little bit. Yeah, it just basically is adjusting the sensitivity or the displayed info, right? Yep, same power is going to be going out. The actual radar unit's going to be detecting the same precipitation, just changing up what it's showing you in the cockpit. Right. A couple other controls, they might have different names, but there's usually a button called stab or stabilization. From what I understand, basically, it stabilizes you when you're maneuvering the aircraft. It stabilizes the radar picture. So if you go into a bank, it eliminates all of the ground clutter you're getting when you're in turn, from what I understand. Is that right, Dan? I believe so, yeah. And we actually got a question on social media where somebody asked that. And they said, here's the question. I still don't know if tilt is independent of the deck angle of the airplane that I fly or if it's tied to it. That's what somebody wrote in and said. I think every system could be a little bit different, so I don't think we can answer that one specifically. But I think the point is that that information is probably not being shared to people when they're coming online. Like we said, the weather radar stuff is just not being covered. So that's one of those questions you're going to have to dig into your manual, I think, when you go fly. And that's an important question to understand. That's the first homework assignment, right? Yeah. Go find your radar manual. Exactly. (laughs) Step one. Well, it's like in the course you mentioned Go figure out the size of your antenna. What's the diameter? Because there's some calculations that you can make based on that. But had an interesting comment from somebody the other day that flies for one of the low-cost airlines. And these low-cost carriers now are hiring pilots straight out of flight instructing. And their comment was, among other things, a flight instructor probably has no exposure to operating weather radar. And so now they're in a big airplane And they don't have that experience that many of us had flying, you know, a charter or regional and learning how to manually manipulate a radar control panel. Yeah. But also on the flip side of that, if you put them in a plane with a newer generation radar, that's pretty automatic as far as tilt and and scanning and all that. You don't have to worry about tilting down to get ground clutter at a certain distance. Like it just kind of has a 3D look at it. So it does make it easier. I guess the learning curve is shortened, I should say. The learning curve is shortened, but also if you were to go out of auto mode, you wouldn't know what you were doing. That's true. But where did you two learn about weather radar when you came on? For me, it was a copy of a copy of a copy of something that Archie Trammell wrote about uh, weather radar and perhaps one of the trade publications. That's a great point, Dan. You may get a handout. Maybe you found a good video on YouTube. But where did most of us really learn how to use it? Hopefully we flew with a captain that kind of showed us And we were willing to watch somebody else operate the radar. And that, I think, is is really the challenge that I'd love to give our listeners is, hey, if you don't really know how to work the weather radar, if the person that you're flying with has got it up and they're doing some stuff, ask them about it. Ask them what they're doing. Ask them why. But it also might be an ask but verify situation because I think that there's (laughs) a lot of people that don't necessarily know, especially with these advanced radar systems. Like, There's a lot to know. And I'll be the first to admit, I don't know about the one in the 737, the RDR-4000. It does a lot. And you can, just by not doing it, but turning it on, it will tell you most of what you need to know. Sure. But not everything. And the other thing, too, is like you have to understand the symbology and all that, like the basics. And I think there's confusion about that. Just like you said, what the cross-hatched area means or what a certain color means. And just with a quick search on YouTube, there's a 40-minute training video from Honeywell probably everything on that radar system. I don't know. I I have not watched it, but I intend to now just after cracking the lid on this whole thing. Yeah. By learning a little bit, you learn what you don't know. And that's equally as important, I think, you know. Absolutely. To understand. You know, my core radar information I got later in my career, but I was attended safety stand down one fall and a radar training international gentleman by the name of Eric, who who flies for uh, Alaskan Airlines, took that company over and taken Archie's information and really brought it into this century and has just a wonderful class. I took a four-hour class 
there at Safety Stand Down, but I think he's got even a full day course on it from Raider Training International, but really gets into all of the basics that you don't get trained elsewhere and get that core information that then you could take to any radar system and be set for the rest of your career to really understand how to use it well. Yeah, there are some basic principles, understanding the tilt, where are you looking, how do you have the sensitivity set, what is the good cruise sets? I think that's all super valuable. And I don't pretend to have. Well, the big thing I think where we all learn about weather radar is in the application of yes. using it. And the yeah, thing is how you could go months with never needing to turn the weather radar. I mean, right. regularly, right? And so I think the thing is when you do use it, especially if you're an inexperienced pilot, those short snapshots you get to actually be exposed to it are super important. And if you take a little bit of time before that happens to learn about your system and learn some of the basics, I think you can get a lot more out of those exposures to actual use. And then I just picked up this book. It was just published last year from ASA by David Eisen, Navigating Weather, A Pilot's Guide to Airborne and Data Weather Radar. So I haven't dived into the entire book yet, but it looks like a good basics of radar information, good baseline. So if I'm a new pilot or want a refresher, I'd definitely take a look at that book as well. I think some of the other things, too, is is when we talk about weather avoidance, a thousand feet above a thunderstorm for every 10 knots of wind speed. I remember yeah. learning that and about lateral 20 distances, miles, 20 yeah. miles around a thunderstorm. And then you look, there's a really cool video in the training that we took. I think it was in Memphis and it showed big thunderstorms coming in and everybody, the the track of all like hundreds of airplanes coming into Memphis, you know, I'm assuming it was FedEx probably when they're all coming in for the sort. And in real life, too, you see... When it's trying to get to the airport, like nobody's going 20 miles around a thunderstorm and everybody gets in this mindset and then it's basically follow the leader. Right. Where no one's going to say, well, I can't do that because it's less than 20 miles when the person in front of you just did it. And so I didn't expect to see that in a weather radar course, but the mentality of everybody out there. And if you fly into big airports where there's a bunch of traffic, you Mm -hmm. see it. Everybody's doing what the guy in front of me do. Where'd he go? Did he make it over to the fix or whatever? It's interesting how some of those rules of thumb seem to just kind of go out the window in the heat of the moment. And they also did a study, some of the statistics were at night, if people are running late or following other people, that was where the highest propensity of all of that stuff to go out the window. People just like turn around the red and make it happen, which then kind of brought you to the American Airlines Little Rock deal, which is a very interesting weather avoidance scenario or lack thereof, I guess. That's what I really enjoyed about the course, Dan, was the way that you guys spliced in a lot of these videos and case studies so that you could really get a sense of the real world application. One of the real world kind of reminders that I enjoyed is, you know, you hear about, oh, like the scalloping radar and the attenuating radar and the hook shape or the clam shake and a lot of that stuff. And that's something I've never really honestly seen in the 20 years of flying. I haven't seen a ton of that out there on there. And so... It's a good refresher because sometimes you're not going to see that stuff out on the line. Once in a while, I want to hear about a tornado in the area. I'll pull up the weather radar to take what it looks like. And once in a while, I've seen that hook pattern. Mm-hmm. You know, So I see some of those signatures, even in that weather mosaic from Nexrad, in some of what those tall tale signs look like. Right. We're going to take a quick break from our weather radar conversation and talk about a different tool that's available to pilots, a different resource for scanning for hazards, Max. And of course, we're talking about our friend Tim Pope, Certified Financial Planner, who's been helping professional pilots nationwide create and execute a smart financial strategy. Timothy P. Pope, your financial planning partner for all faces of your financial flight. Check the show notes for a link to book your free appointment with Tim. All right, back to the show. Let's talk a little bit about some of the other operating techniques when we're flying along, flying along. It's a rough day out there. Maybe you're flying over central U.S. Both pilots have their radar up. One comment we got from social media says, one of my big pet peeves is when the co-pilot or the first officer has their weather radar set exactly the same as me. And I think part of that could be because maybe they don't know what they should be doing, but Dan, can you explain why that may not be what you want to do or how to take the most advantage of weather radar when it comes to different sweeps on different sides of the cockpit? Yeah, and I would once in a while get annoyed if I was doing that tactical deviation around something and somebody would go in and start changing their settings pretty rapidly. Yeah. Because, you know, it's going to take it. And in the aircraft that I flew, 
it was kind of one sweep would display on one side of the cockpit. The next sweep would display on the next one if you had it set differently. So perhaps there's even twice as much of a delay in getting that feedback on your side where your eyes are at and you're navigating around. And so if the other person has a predetermined way that they're doing it and they're going to scan up a little bit more, or help add to the situational awareness, use that CRM and communicate back and forth. Great. If they're doing it just to and they don't know what they're doing, paying a bunch of ground and taking up half of the bandwidth of the aircraft, that could be degrading from the situational awareness as well. So what Dan's saying, too, is for folks that don't know, typically one direction of the sweep goes to one of the pilots and one direction goes to the other pilot. But if you don't know what you're doing, you can turn yours off. And it'll give the other pilot both the sweeps and they're going to get double the information. So, Or double the refresh rate. Double the refresh rate, at least. And so usually, I love what Dan said when he talked about CRM, because I think that's a great example of CRM. And I think it should come from the captain and say, hey, I want you at the 25 mile range or f- whatever your setting is. I'm going to be at the 50 or vice. And I think that a little bit of coordination, especially with a lot of the more inexperienced folks, will really bring a lot of value because then you can get kind of a more complete picture. Let's see here. Let me look and see if we got any other comments on social media here about any other pet peeves while we're on our soapbox right now. I like this. (laughs) Which one did you see? I had a captain paint the ground and ask for vectors when severe clear. (laughs) (laughs) I had that happen to me at night flying the Saab 340. Same thing like you're saying with the old separate weather radar screen, you know. He's got it tilted all the way down and we're flying in California over the ocean. And then we start painting the coastline. It's like, look at this line. Where did this just came out of nowhere? You know, and I'm just like, it looks uh, as dense as yeah. sand. Look yeah. at that. But it brings up a good point, actually, which is weather radar is awesome. Have it on. Look at it. But don't forget to look out the window, too, <laughs> you know. But I see people fixate on it. You know, there's red everywhere. There's all these cells. It's like, well, you also got to kind of open your eye. You got to come by. It's one tool. Sure. I've had the opposite where air traffic control contacts you and says, reference weather at 12 o'clock, which way do you want to deviate? That's like, hmm, maybe we should turn the radar on. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to talk for a minute a little bit about this RDR 4000 that we keep talking about, Max. I had a chance to talk to that Honeywell engineer. So it's basically going out in scanning an entire picture of the sky in auto mode. And it's going, it's starting up at the top and then working its way down or whatever the algorithm is. And it basically builds a database of the entire sky. And then it calculates where you're at. So it goes, okay, he's at flight level 350. I'm going to show him, you know, a window 4,000 feet above and below. And I'm going to take out, I'm going to use the EGD GPWS database to take out any ground return. And I'm just going to show him what I think the pilot wants to see. And like we mentioned, that's pretty awesome. Like 95% 95% of the time. 95% of the time. (laughs) It's pretty good. But he mentioned some cool stuff. And just wet your whistle for anyone that maybe uses that system, the RDR 4000, which is in, would you say it's in the Max? At our airline, it's in the 800s, which are newer, and then the the Max has the same one. And it sounds like it's in the Airbuses. But anyways, you can put it in a manual mode and then ask it to show you a return at a specific altitude, which I think is awesome. I've never had an airplane that you could do something I'm really like that. looking forward to learning how to do yeah. that. But that's just one example of how these systems work. But again, that thing's showing you what it thinks you want. Not necessarily always going to be the case. The, the example of the analogy he used, it's like taking a picture with your cell phone camera with all of the settings in auto. Nine times out of 10, it's going to give you the exposure that you want. But there are times when you're going to have to put something manual. Maybe you need the flash on, maybe you need to adjust something. So it is important to understand how to manipulate the systems to show you what you want. Well, another interesting thing too, I think a lot of business aviation pilots, depending on what airplanes they fly, is that these radars now do predictive wind shear warnings. Mm -hmm. So the radar scans ahead automatically without your intervention and it will look and see if it sees movement of precipitation, gets returns and through its algorithm says there's going to be wind shear. I mean, it'll say wind shear, it'll tell you to go around, it'll show on the screen where the wind shear is going to be so you can actually like avoid it. It's really awesome that mm-hmm. some of the, how far this stuff has come from the CRT screen in the middle of the dash. One other thing I learned that was interesting, you mentioned the turbulence detection. I think this was mentioned in your course, Dan, I can't remember, but the turbulence detection weather radar is detecting the like motion patterns of moisture. You have to have something to reflect right. for radar to work, period. Right. That's it. I mean... And so it has some algorithm. It goes, oh, okay, the moisture is moving in a certain way. I'm going to call that turbulence. But what it doesn't do is obviously detect clear air turbulence. So it's just another limitation to understand. Well, 
hopefully this discussion has at least piqued your interest to go get your weather radar manual out, I think. You're going to do it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Weather radar manual, find some training on your specific radar. Mm -hmm. And also, if you're interested, the Advanced Air Crew Academy radar training module is really good. Yeah. I think a lot of people don't understand, like, how long is a radar training module? Are we talking, Mm -hmm. like, half a day or what? It's like the timing on it was like an hour and 20 minutes or right around an hour. I mean, it's really not that much of your time, but super valuable. Time well spent, that's for sure. Absolutely. So we salute you, Dan, for your uh, you and your team putting that together. And before we go, we got to get any good radar stories, boys. So I was flying for a small part 91 operation, one airplane, two pilots out here in Colorado. The owner was still based up in Minnesota. And every year he gave the airplane to the local Catholic archdiocese to use the airplane for the bishops. And they could go anywhere they wanted in the country, all expense paid, week-long trip. Wow. So it was an interesting trip every year to go pick them up. Picked them up. They wanted to go to Grand Junction. They went to a dude ranch there for a week. So we dropped them off there and we went and picked them up in the morning. Our intent was to fly back, drop them off in Minneapolis. And we got there and they said, you know what? We have never seen the Grand Canyon. So do you think you could take us to go see the Grand Canyon on the way back, opposite direction, but sort of on the way back to Minneapolis. So we said, sure. <laughs> Boss said, you can use the airplane, whatever you want. So we flew into the Grand Canyon Airport, which is a super cool airport. Right. Um, just there on the south rim. Not designed for business aviation, though. The pilot lounge was up on the second floor of the hangar and 125 degrees. <laughs> and I figured it'd be like one of those vacation movies where you walk up to the rim, you kind of look left and right and go, huh, yep, all right, we're ready. So we all the flight plan, you know, we're just waiting for them to come, sitting on the ramp. Didn't come, didn't come. Finally went and got lunch, came back, kept updating the flight plan. Twelve and a half hours later, they come back. <laughs> and we've just been on standby all day. Okay, you ready to go? And by that point, thunderstorms had broken out all over the central United States. So take off out of there and we're up at uh, 41,000 feet, headed eastbound. And over on top of the storms, you know, with all the bishops in the back and lightning all over the place, but over the top of the storm, of course, everything goes well. We drop in, drop them off late at night, pick up our crew lunches. You know, it's now one o'clock in the morning. So we're flying back over these same thunderstorms that we just came over, long super squall line cell. And we're back up at high altitude, 39,000 feet climbing over the top of them. Lunches are sitting on our laps because that's where we had our crew meals and just sitting there quiet. And all of a sudden, lightning hits us. Aircraft depressurizes. It opens the door seal, which we didn't know what happened at the time. The airplane just depressurized. So we put on our oxygen masks. And what's our one choice but to descend into the thunderstorm unless we want to stay up at the high altitude? But we're trying to have this, you know, communication, this CRM, and figure out that the microphone in my oxygen mask doesn't work because, Uh you know, the oxygen mask, when was the last time that was used or tested? Right. And the speaker on the other guys didn't work. And so it was a hear no evil, see no evil of hand gestures of what are we going to do? And it's just us on board. So, you know, the lunch is just thrown in the cockpit. And here we start an emergency descent down, which we probably could have just stayed up at altitude and not done that descent. Came out and down to 10,000 feet, couldn't get to the aircraft to pressurize. So we flew 10,000 feet the rest of the way back to Colorado and dropped the aircraft off. And so I say, of course, with the bishops on board, flying over the top of the thunderstorm, nothing bad happens, but uh, kick them off the airplane. <laughs> Just the crew coming back and catches up with us and lightning finally strikes us there. But uh, yeah, it's the only time my wife said she heard me come home like at three o'clock in the morning and she came downstairs looking for me because I didn't come up to bed and I'm just sitting in the dark with a cocktail in my hand and she said, oh, it must have been a rough night. <laughs> yes. Staring yes, off into was. the abyss. <laughs> Did you go to confession the next day? <laughs> <laughs> I saved that till the next yeah. year when we had the opportunity to fly yeah, him. Right. And saved up everything for a year. Right. <laughs> oh, man. That's crazy. I don't have anything that can top that, I don't think. Yeah, I don't think I That's have That's pretty one. good. Your stories are the best, Dan. If you want to hear, when we talked to Dan last time, it was about runway excursions. And you told us the story of your owner that passed away while you were on a trip. I'm not going to give the ending away. Oh, yeah. That was... Let's go listen <laughs> to that one. <laughs> That was one of my favorites. That was but, good. Well, that's just a little teaser on what you can find in the Advanced Air Crew Academy weather radar module. Like I said, I hope everyone got their ears perked up a little bit and say, I mean, look, we've been doing this for 20 years and I learned stuff. And you know what? I pulled up the Challenger manual yesterday. I'm looking. You know, you said, go figure out what the diameter of your radar dish. I had to go look that up again. I got into the book. It was super valuable. So listen, we don't have all the answers, but. It's not sexy, but it's important. Yeah. 
with the Raider. We're tired of talking about the job market and also the craziness going on right now. So we thought we'd just bring it back to some technical basics. Absolutely. Well, Dan, we appreciate it. Thank you uh, for calling in. And we look forward to chatting with you again for the next time to when we can learn to become a better pilot. Awesome. Thanks. Keep up the good work. Enjoy and listening. All right. right. Thanks, Thanks, Dan. Dan. All right. Number 79. I think that's going to do it for this episode. We can. Ready to move on. I'd love to say thanks to Advanced Air Crew Academy and our friend Dan for their longtime partnership with us, joining us to share some great knowledge. We'll have the link to the weather radar module in the show notes. And like I said, go do a little homework. Go learn about what your airplane's radar system is. Ask questions with people that you fly with. When you hit the brakes, so fly right by. Do that too. (laughs) Thanks to Harvey Watt, Tim Pope, and uh, all of the listeners that wrote in for the mailbag, flight advice, reviews. It is all certainly appreciated. Max, it's summertime. I think we might have to take a little bit of a break, some vacation coming up. So stay tuned on social media. We'll let you know when our next episode's coming out, but I'm going on vacation for a couple weeks. So I'm going to take some time off. What are you going to do? You got big plans. You've been flying your airplane a ton. Yeah, we got a vacation. I actually have like a sanctioned vacation in Ooh. July. Somehow I snake. So yeah. I love it. Okay. We'll keep you posted when the next episode's going to be. We're probably going to take a break for a little bit. We're looking forward to joining you in episode 80, though. But until then, remember flexibility is the key to air power. Give us one more drop. Jesus, this guy's good. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we'll see you guys and gals in a few weeks. Take me to bed and lose me forever. The statements made in this show are our own opinions and do not reflect, nor were they under any direction from any of our employers.